Uh, hey guys, so in this session we'll be integrating our front end to the dank not dank backend and this is so that we are able to send an image to the server and have our model find out whether the photo is dank or not dank. Alright, so first we're going to start off by setting up our terminal. Go into view and press the integrated terminal or control tilde. Over here what you want to type in now is npm i save react drop zone this is so that we can actually drag and drop our photos like you can see into the dank not dank website and next we'll be installing the types for react drop zone and so what the types does is that since we're using TypeScript, everything needs to be explicitly typed. It is a statically typed language. That means that we cannot implicitly declare variables if you have done a programming language. All variables must be explicitly typed. So instead of just saying, well, x equals to 5, we have to go let x is equal to 5. So we'll just wait for this to download. So while we wait, um, I'll actually be talking about the next package we download. So this is the React Lotus Spinner. And so if you go up onto the Dank Not Dank website and actually upload a model to the website, you'll see that there's a place where the image can be hosted and also where the spinner goes. I'll just show you quickly. So Dank Not Dank. So you drag and drop some files over here and the spinner will be showing up over there. Alright, so hopefully the next one doesn't take so long. PMI type slash react drop zone. And so, when you install it and you have the dash dash slave flag, if you go into your package.json, you can actually see over here that we have our React drop zone here now. And once we install the typings, it will be inside of here too. And also, I is a short form for install. Instead of typing out npm install every single time, we just type in npm i. And finally, we have to install all of the other files in package.json, so just go npm i quickly. And while this waits for downloading, we'll actually configure our imports now. So what I want you to do next is you go import drop zone from react drop zone. And so this says that it's declared by the values never read. Don't worry about it, we'll fix that later and import loader from react loader spinner all right now before we do this it's saying that cannot find module react loader spinner and this is because typescript doesn't have an explicit typing for react loader spinner so what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to navigate to our source file source folder sorry and go into images.d.ts over here what we're gonna do is we're gonna go declare declare module react loader spinner all right now we're going to go back to app.tsx and we should get the same error as before so now we've explicitly typed it and so it's fine to actually have that there so we're going to have to do one more thing so go into your root folder and navigate to tslint.json and just wipe the contents of it because we don't really need linting in this it's a small project and it's just going to cause us more problems than it isn't so anyways we're now ready to actually start the coding so in react you can define a function sorry a component two different ways you can actually define it as either a function or a class so keep this in mind and we'll talk more about this shortly so firstly we want to now 
declare the interface that the state of the component will adhere to. So what the state of the component actually is, is that you can think of it as a private field for the component. So only the component has access to it and it's fully controlled by the component. So we want to declare an interface I state. So sorry, capital S there. Follow language conventions. And so what you want to do is you want to have your image files, which is an array of any of type any. And then we want to have your results, which is also of type any. Really, we should be giving this proper types, but it's okay for now. And drop zone, which is of type any. So don't worry about what the drop zone is too much. It's a special type of variable that we're going to bind context to. Um, you don't have to worry about it too much. I'll explain it a bit later. And so the error says, again, it's declared, but the value is never read. All right. So I'll explain what the interface does. So what the image files does is when you upload an image onto the Dank Not Dank website, it actually stores that in here. And of course, obviously, the results are the results you get back. So now what we want to do is we want to extend our component so that it actually it adheres to the state properties we want. So just over here, inside of the pointy brackets, you want to go I state. Sorry, capital S. Yep, cool. And now we see that I state has been used. All right, so what we're going to do next is we're actually going to um, initialize our constructor. So props, again, are a way of storing state in React. Yep, and we need a super call inside of there, just so that we pass the parent up if it's extending from anything. Sorry, we pass the props up if it's inheriting from something. And so now what we want to do is we want to just initialize the state. So think of the constructor as some way where you initialize your state variables or very yep your state variables and in typescript of course you remember you cannot have implicitly typed variables so we're going to have to initialize them so this dot state is equal to and so we're initializing the state of the entire component and this is actually an object in which that contains variables. So image files is just an empty array. Sorry, files. All right, and then we want to go results, which is empty for now, and drop zone. What we're going to do now is So what the drop zone pretty much does is it binds the context to the function we'll run later. So in JavaScript, when you're running any asynchronous function calls, what happens is that you lose context. And that means that you're not able to access any of the other private variables that you had in the previous context because your function is now running on another thread. Don't worry about this too much, you know, it's just a little bit extra for experts explaining what's going on over here. But what we're pretty much doing is we're binding the current context so that we have access to the same execution variables as the original thread does. All right, so our constructor is complete. So now what we'll do is we'll start with the on drop function. So if you remember, you go to the dank not dank website, you can try dropping some files here. And that's possible only if we have the on drop function. So the libraries do most of the work for us, but we can't actually get away with doing no coding, unfortunately. So we'll be coding that now. So here will be the first time we're setting state, set state. And we're going to be setting an object in there. So we're going to be setting image files is equal is files, whatever files we drop there, and results again is nothing because we have no results yet. 
So then we have const file is equal to file zero. So that's pretty much the first file we have in the R file array. And we'll now be opening up a file reader. So this is so that we can actually convert our image to a binary string. So if you're wondering what the arrow is, that's what they call an arrow function. Um, that's a feature of ECMAScript 6. So normally JavaScript that you see for web development and things like that is called ECMAScript 5. That can pretty much be described as a language upgrade. And they've given you these cool things like Lambda functions, which are pretty much um, anonymous functions. So that's function without actually calling it a function. It's just a shorthand. What this actually is, is just a function. And so what this does is just make sure that the target is not null. It, again, it's just a shorthand for it. Um, result might be showing up in red, but don't worry about that. Uh, there definitely is a field called result. And then now what we're going to do is we're going to upload it. So I'll explain this, right? We haven't actually created our upload function yet, but what BTOA pretty much does is it creates the binary string into a base64 string. And this is so that we can actually send it over the internet with no problems. And here in the final line, what we want to do is we want to make the reader read it as a binary string. Sorry, wrong one. Cool. And now we can actually implement our upload function. So the input for the upload function is a base64 string like you saw previously. And now what we'll be doing is we will be uploading this to the Dank Not Dank website. Um, since a lot of this is just, you know, really simple code, I will be copy pasting it from the GitHub and I will just be running over it quickly. So if you just navigate over here to github.com. And you go into API plus logic. You go down over here, copy this, bring that in here and paste it. So the reason I didn't want to actually type that out is as you can see, it would be a little bit painful typing out all the URLs and things like that. And this is mostly just configuration files. So what this actually does is it sends a HTTP request to the dank not dank API and it sends a post request. So imagine going to the mail office and sending a post, sorry, the post office and sending a post to your friend. That's pretty much what we are doing currently. There's also other ways of, sorry, other methods that we can use such as get and you're going to the post office and you're getting your email. You can think of it like that. And so we need to set up content type and headers um, so that the API actually knows what we're sending over to it. And the body of it will be the file, which is the base64 string. And of course, then dot then pretty much does what you think it does. It runs this asynchronous function and then it executes this one. So it'll check if the response is okay. If the response is okay, then you, you know, set the state to if it's dank or not, not dank. And otherwise, then we set the response to the error and return the response. So let's check this error. Yeah, don't worry about that. I'm sure it's fine. We'll have a look at it later if it isn't. All 
Okay, so now, last but not least, we will be doing the render function. Again, I'm just going to copy this in because I'm sure you guys don't want to write in a lot of HTML as well. It's, it's just a little bit painful. I will be copying it and explain how it works. So actually, just copy the whole function. Yep, cool. So we have the render function over here. And it looks like we're almost complete. Okay, let's try running it now. So type in your command line npm start. And let's see if this works. So while we're waiting, I'll actually just explain what this does. And so pretty much what we're doing is you only need to worry about this over here, drop zone here, and this here. Oh, interesting. Cannot resolve React Lotus Spinner. Did we forget that something? Small technical error, looks like we actually forgot to install uh, React Loader Spinner. So just go npm i React Loader Spinner and install it and it should be fine. So now let's go back npm start and it should be working. So while we wait here, I'll actually describe what a callback function is. And so remember when we talked about um, asynchronous calls in JavaScript. So when you want to do an asynchronous call, the control goes away from your main thread and your function is now executed in another thread. And so the way you deal with this is that if you want to you know, execute a piece of code after your asynchronous loop is completed, you cannot actually do it in your main code because your main code has continued to execute now. And how you deal with that is by using a callback function. So once your asynchronous piece of code is finished executing, you can go something like dot then or have an error function that dictates the next piece of code that should be executed. All right, so hopefully that was clear. You can Google that a bit more for some more clarity. All right, let's uh, tab over and see. Okay, so we can actually drop some files over here. All right, uh, we'll save for that. It looks a, bit, a little bit ugly right now. I mean, even after we do the CSS stuff, it's still gonna look a little bit ugly, but at least it'll be kind of shiny. Um, so now pop on over to your styles.css, all right? And you can see that we have some, yeah, you know, divs here. So when you reference it with the dot, that's a class and this just applies it to all of the edit headers with h1 so what i want you to do is navigate back to the github and copy this and paste that in so again it's just a bit of css you know it's a little bit boring typing it all out and so copy pasting it i think is not too bad so i'll pretty much explain what's going on here we're limiting the drop zone to pretty much half of the vertical height available. Uh, we're giving it a dash border like we've seen. Here with the image, we're limiting the max width, the height, and we're giving it some padding. And the dot dank, let's see what that does. So the, that, that pretty much is for the loader and the results. And that just gives it a little bit of padding so that it doesn't look like it's stuck to the image. All right, so now let's go test the website out that we've built. All right, so we can, you know, drop some memes in here. 
So I'm sure everyone that's taking computer science knows how this feels. Just give it a second. Well, this is taking a while. Let's look at. Let's see what's happening. So, if you press Control Shift I, you can go into the Dev Tools, and you can go to the network. Ah, right, right, right. So you have. Okay. So as you can see here, um, we have the try dropping some files here. You can click on it and actually drop a file, but it's not quite complete yet. We still need to put the frame around it and we need to give it a little bit of CSS to make it kind of shiny, even though it's ugly.